Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on plug load control. I'm Andrea Silvestri, and before we get started with the webinar, I'm going to go over a few webinar logistics. So during today's webinar, we'll be discussing results from research from the National Renewable Energy Laboratory and the full report, as well as a one-page infographic and four-page findings, and additional resources are available at gsa.gov. Today's webinar is one in a series of webinars. In March, we'll be hosting a webinar on one of GPG's reports on LED lighting, LED downlight lamps for CFL fixtures. Being a light bulb, it's one of the simplest retrofits out there. April's webinar will discuss electrochromic windows. To assess tenant acceptance of EC windows, GPG has assessed the technology in two buildings with glass curtain wall facades, as well as in a land port of entry. And April's webinar will present those results from those three reports. In May, we'll feature the Honeycomb Solar Thermal Collector. GPG evaluated this technology because the 2007 Energy Independence and Security Act requires new construction and major renovations to meet 30% of hot water demand with solar energy, provided it's cost effective over the life of the system. May's uh, webinar will present results from that research. Today's webinar, as all of GPG webinars, are offer one continuing education learning unit through the American Institute of Architects. To receive credit, you can complete the post-webinar survey. You should receive this survey shortly after the webinar is completed. If you don't receive the survey, please reach out to Michael Hobson at michael.hobson at gsa.gov. Today's broadcast is set to listen only, uh, but you can submit questions using the chat box on the right side of your screen. And you don't need to wait until the Q&A session at the end to submit your questions. In fact, we encourage you to submit questions well in advance of the Q&A. And now let's get started with the webinar. Mike Lowell, a GPG project manager, will be facilitating today's presentation. Mike. Welcome, everyone. Next slide, please. In today's webinar, Kevin Powell will be giving a brief overview of GSA's Proving Ground program. After this overview, Rose Longer will share a presentation discussing advances in plug load control. And Dylan Cutler from the National Renewable Energy Laboratory will summarize the research results. Dylan's presentation will be followed by on the ground feedback from John Teagan from GSA in Region 3, which is the Philadelphia region. Lastly, Nazreen will provide a quick overview of GSA's nationwide deployment of this technology. We will end the webinar with an interactive Q&A session, as Andrea just indicated. With that, Kevin, take it away. Oops, sorry. <laughs> Pulling myself off of mute here. Um, thank you very, uh, very, very much, Mike. Um, and next slide. Um, so I just want to give a, a very brief overview to um, all of you who are uh, here on this webinar. First of all, thank you for joining. Um, and um, secondly, just to say why GSA is committed to innovation and why we're committed to having an innovation program at GSA, um, even in these budget-constrained times. That innovation program, as you can see on the slide, is called Emerging Technologies. Um, there are two halves to the program, the first being the Proving Ground um, program, which we'll talk a little bit more about. That's really the subject of today's webinar. That is to say, we try out the most promising next generation technologies in the field, in the real world operating environment of our buildings. Um, we use a balanced scorecard approach to evaluate them. That is to say, do they deliver the environmental performance they claim? Do people, tenants, and our operators like them? Uh, are they cost effective? And do they really have um, the ability to transform how we're doing business? On the second half of the program, we call pilot to portfolio. Those technologies that really deliver um, the performance in that balanced scorecard way I just uh, referred to, and really the greatest bang for the buck, those are ones that we're looking 
to really roll out widely. And in fact, advanced power strips are one of those um, technologies that have been part of the pilot, have been part of both halves of the program. Uh, next slide. Um, just a, a sort of a, as a framework um, for us to all think about what it is that uh, that really keeps next generation technologies from reaching the marketplace. There's actually a fairly rich pipeline of innovation. There's a pretty reasonable way in which investment in research and development for new technologies occurs. The challenge is that the building industry by and large is relatively conservative. We have buildings where there's typically large investments um, made um, in, in, in those technologies, and we need to know that they're going to work. Building managers are, are conservative by nature, and there's a, an old adage that nobody ever got fired for specifying IBM. So despite the fact you're really looking to have improved performance from your building stock, uh, trying out something new is just, generally speaking, considered risky. Um, with that said, G, uh, the GPG program was established by GSA to take on that first use risk. Um, that's exactly what the program does. And when we have published a finding, we're really looking to say, broadly speaking, do we think this technology can deliver? To those that do, uh, we've actually, as I say, deployed a number of them. Currently, nine technologies across 200 buildings and really some pretty significant savings, $7.5 million of annual savings from those GPG technologies we've deployed in the past couple of years alone. Um, next slide. Uh, just a short overview of the process by which we um, select technologies. So if you're thinking about submitting one in the future, this is how it works. Uh, to understand how these uh, advanced power strips were selected. This is how they were selected. Uh, first step is we publish every fall a request for information. Um, if you're interested in being on a mailing list to receive a notification when that request is published, um, please submit your name um, in the chat window. Uh, those technologies are, that are submitted to the request for information are scored by third-party subject matter experts as well as our an internal group of subject matter experts that we call the technical committee. Um, those with the greatest promise for our agency are then selected for piloting within our portfolio. Uh, we partner with Department of Energy National Labs. In this case, it would be Pacific Northwest National Lab um, to really ensure that our assessments are objective, credible, defensible. And then lastly, at the end of the day, we're not looking for reports that sit on the shelf or our one-off case studies of, hey, it worked here. We're really looking to generalize those results and say, hey, this is something that we think has broad potential for GSA and potentially for the broader federal community as well as corporate real estate. So with that, I think that's my last slide. Next slide. Um, I want to actually, it's not my last slide because we added this one. Um, I want to uh, just offer a few broad words of, of thanks. And I think that's actually pretty important in particular for this, this presentation. Um, there's a lot of folks who have touched this study, and as I say, it has been a deployment campaign for us, a successful deployment campaign, I should say. Um, first, I, I want to really thank uh, Region 3. Um, that's, our, that's our region headquartered in Philadelphia. John Teagan was the champion for this. He's going to be talking a bit later on. Uh, they really conceptualized this study. They brought it to, uh, to our program. Um, and they really, really uh, kept with it, even when there were some, some setbacks, in order to help us get across the finish line to a successful um, outcome. And then I want to also thank, uh, you'll, you'll be hearing um, uh, from NREL. Um, they, and, you know, and I, actually, I think I may have misspoke there earlier, but NREL is actually the um, national lab, the National Renewable Energy Lab, that did this study. Um, and um, 
and that they really, uh, and again, I want to, again, just give them a shout out for this. Uh, when we came, when we started the study that, you know, sort of went uh, down a sort of path and wasn't exactly delivering the kind of results that we needed, uh, NREL really um, went back, rethought what we were doing, reconfigured this study, and allowed us to actually arrive at a result that's extremely useful to us essentially to be able to break apart um, capabilities to understand what would be the, the essentially in this case the 80 percent of the value for 20 percent of the cost that really allowed us to um, to engage in that deployment campaign um, and then uh, thirdly I want to give a shout out to uh, to our Office of Facilities Management and to uh, Nazarene AA um, in particular for really spearheading a deployment campaign that um, that 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 accomplished a couple of things. First of all, it saved energy. That's important. Um, delivered on the value and promise of these of this technology from 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 that perspective. But the second thing that it did, and I think again, I really want to thank Naz for this, um, that uh, it allowed us to really reach out to our tenants and to help engage them in a conversation about what. Um, you know what what they can do to help um, achieve um, you know better building performance by with something really really quite sim as simple as a power strip essentially um, and then last and certainly not least and I don't think we have them on the phone today but uh, GSA has two halves to our agency one half is the building service the public building service I work for the public building service and most of the folks on the call do as well like all of them do um, uh, on our team, um, that's the side that manages all of those federal buildings that we talk about. But the other half of GSA is the Federal Acquisition Service. They're responsible for all of the mechanisms by which we can buy things. And in this particular case, they really helped us creatively leverage that big buying power of the federal government to get a great deal on these uh, on these power strips, and also to be able to um, take a product that is typically made in made overseas in China and have it made in America, which was uh, really again um, something I think that's impressive. And so, with that, I think that's my last slide. I'm going to turn this over to Rose. Great, thanks, Kevin. Um, I'm Rose Langner with the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. I'm an architectural engineer and building scientist. I've been with the lab for the past 10 years, oh, 10 years, eight years. I'm <laughs> not quite 10 yet. Um, and uh, for the past number of years, four years or so, I've also been the technical lead of the Department of Energy's Better Buildings Alliance for uh, plug and process loads. Next slide. So today I'm going to provide uh, an overview of what plug loads are, why they are becoming so important in regards to building energy efficiency, and I'll also go through more of a high-level overview of the many options that are currently on the market and options that are coming onto the market that we have to actually control plug loads. Um, so to start, let's talk about plug loads. So plug loads include all plug-in and hardwired or connected loads in a building that are not associated with the heating, ventilation, or air conditioning system, uh, the lighting system, water heating, or any other building equipment needed for basic building operation. Um, they can include equipment used for commercial or industrial processes, uh, as well as equipment used in power distribution from the grid to the building. So typically, these are just all these miscellaneous loads, all these plug-in little loads uh, that are often used by individual occupants. So there's usually a, a large association of plug load energy consumption with both the, the mission of the building or the organization as well as individual behavior. So that's an important piece of plug loads. Next slide. So I like presenting this graph. This is from the 2015 EIA Annual Energy Outlook. Um, and for 2016, 
2015, it shows that MELs typically consume about 30% of residential building loads. So it's a whole building energy. And for commercial buildings, it's higher. It's over 30%, it's 36%. And these, uh, uh, this load is projected to grow. Um, if you look at the 2030 marks, uh, we see for residential, it's supposed to grow to 34%, and for commercial buildings to 43%. Um, and something that you'll notice, too, is that all the other building loads are decreasing at the same time. We're have, we see more and more efficient uh, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning systems, more efficient lighting systems, more efficient building envelopes. So we have this reduction in energy that's attributed to the other building loads, but uh, the plug loads or miscellaneous electric loads in buildings are increasing uh, because we're not controlling them as well. Um, and there's more and more devices coming onto the market that people are, are purchasing. And especially when we get to high performance buildings, this percentage is even larger. So for an example, at NREL's research support facility, which is a net zero energy building, our plug loads consume, uh, I, I think it's about 55% of our whole building energy right now. So it's a much larger piece of the pie. And there is a lot we can do and we can continue to do to, to really address that energy consumption in our buildings. Next slide. So typically, when we do implement controls to plug loads, we can see up to about 30% energy savings for individual plug loads. I've even seen this higher, maybe up to 40%, depending on the type of equipment and what control strategy you're implementing for that. Um, and this can translate, I've seen a, a number of case studies, and this is where this number is coming from, uh, up to 10% of the whole building energy consumption. So that can really be some large energy savings that these buildings can see just from controlling all these miscellaneous electric loads and plug loads. Next slide. So as I mentioned, I'm the technical lead for the Better Buildings Alliance Plug-in Process Load Technical Research Team. Um, so most of the plug load related work that I do uh, is done through the Better Buildings Alliance. And, and the Alliance really serves as a platform for building owners and managers to discuss questions, issues, or even successes that they've had with building energy efficiency. And they're partnered with uh, members from the national laboratories and other subject matter experts. Um, and we help them address or come up with solutions to really further advance energy saving technologies in their buildings. The next slide. So that the Better Buildings Initiative has a number of sub-programs in there. So this is just highlighting that the Better Buildings Alliance is that one sub-program that really works directly with the building owners and managers to address these, these issues they might be having. Next slide. The plug and process load technical research team, uh, we have our own web page, and this is where we uh, host all of our, our resources. Um, and I will, let me point out that there are a number of technology research teams and market solutions teams that are fall under the Better Buildings Alliance. So plug and process loads is one of those. Um, if you would like to join, please join. Um, there is a join button on the website, or you can also contact me directly after this call. Next slide. And over the years, we've created a number of resources that are dedicated to uh, reducing plug load energy consumption in buildings. And these include decision guides, technical specifications, a uh, quick one-page reference fact sheets, uh, blog posts, et cetera. So those can all be found on, to, on our website. Uh, and they're all really aimed to support building owners and managers in making better decisions around controlling plug loads and reducing this energy consumption in their buildings. Next slide. So I'll talk through some of the more established methods that we do control plug loads. Uh, just very briefly, um, 
we've talked a lot through the Better Buildings Alliance about turn it off campaigns, and we've seen a number of examples of this with our partners, which are great. And, and this is where companies really actively engage with occupants to raise more awareness about turning uh, hog loads off when they're not in use. Um, this may include incentive programs or even competitions between individual tenants. Uh, incentive programs can be in the form of giving your employees boxes of chocolate if they meet their energy goals, or it could even go as far as returning some of their rentable square footage fees back to them if they uh, come in at their goal or even below. So there's a number of ways to incentivize occupants for their behavior in actually turning off equipment. Um, of course, we can always uh, upgrade equipment to Energy Star, and it really is important to engage with procurement officers here and specify what types of equipment you should buy and do some research onto what types. You know, not all monitors are the same. Uh, monitors with the USB ports and the size of them can use a lot more energy than a monitor without that. So that might be a decision that the procurement officer can weigh in here. Um, Built-in low power states. Uh, this is something that comes with a, a lot of pieces of equipment, of course, computers and multifunction printers or printing devices. So uh, making sure that those built-in low power states are actually deployed and devices, perhaps that's the policy rule that the organization takes on and uses at a high level to um, make sure that, that those built-in low power states are being used. Um, you know, it's, I'll point out here and also throughout the rest of my slides that it is also really important to engage with IT staff um, and not just with built-in low power states, but especially with any of the connected devices that I'll be talking about in a few slides um, or the, you know, these IoT, these Internet of Things devices that are coming onto the market where there's always questions to answer about the system setup and especially around cybersecurity and protecting private data with those systems. So involving your IT staff up front is really important, um, as well as having an energy champion who's really going to focus in on plug load energy efficiency and making sure that uh, you're actually implementing the right controls and, and you're keeping up with these turn it off campaigns or making sure that, that the controls aren't being overridden at times when they shouldn't be. Um, lastly, we do, through some of our resources, we talk about actual design strategies for buildings for consolidating plug loads. For instance, uh, a good example is uh, having central locations for multi-function machines rather than having each employee having their own separate printer at their desks. Uh, that's, that's one example. Another example would be for new construction, if you're designing a building, Design it so people use the stairs rather than elevators if it's not that many stories to get back and forth between places. So there, there's a lot of strategies for that to really consolidate how many plug loads you actually even have in a building. Okay, next slide. Great. Um, so since we're focused more on advanced power strips here, um, I want to highlight some resources that we do have. We do have a technical specification for advanced power strips. I like to think about this more as almost a procurement specification because we talk through the many different uh, control types and what to actually look for in an advanced power strip when you're purchasing these for your organization. Um, coupled with that or nicely paired with that, we have a one-page how-to guide uh, which can be printed and distributed to every employee or hung up on walls. And this really tells you what types of devices should be plugged into the different types of outlets on an advanced power strip. Uh, this is extremely helpful because not everybody knows what should be plugged into the control or the switched outlets or the always on. Um, in this example, we're using office equipment here. So, you know, control outlet would be your computer, your laptop, or your desktop. Secondary outlets or the switched outlet should be peripheral 
devices such as monitors or printers or task lights, things that can be turned off when you're not using your computer at the same time. So that's where we get the savings. And there's also always on outlets for devices that do need to be left on, like your telephone or fax machine, um, or maybe you do have a mini fridge at your desk, which are not allowed here at NREL because of our energy budgets that are set in our policy. Um, but that's, that's something that would be plugged into an always on outlet. Next slide. So I'm going to talk through the different control types for advanced power strips and taking just a little step back, you know, advanced power strips are, are similar to conventional power strips that are often used to plug multiple electronic devices into a wall outlet. However, advanced power strips have built-in technology to reduce the plug load run times and save energies when the devices are not in use. Um, so there are different control types for advanced power strips and really depending on what specific equipment you're trying to control, uh, the different control types might work better for that specific device. So it's important to understand what the options are. Um, so I'm going to walk through these. Next slide. Uh, and these are all outlined in the advanced power strip technical specification that I mentioned earlier. Uh, the first one that I'll talk through is a timer power strip. So a timer power strip automatically turns off outlets based on a preset schedule. This can be done two ways. Um, one way is you turn your power strip on and you have a set period of time that you have to work, so maybe 10 hours from when you turn it on, and then it turns off afterwards. Or uh, you can also set it kind of like the, the timer outlets you have at home when you go on vacation for your lights. So you can set it to turn on at a specific time and turn off at a specific time uh, that generally aligns with your schedule. So that's one. Uh, this will be one of the options that Dylan will be talking about that GSA explored through the GPG program. Next slide. The next one I already talked about here. Um, the master controlled power strip where you do have some sort of master device, typically a computer and a workstation. We have switched outlets for the peripheral devices that can be turned off at the same time as the master controlled. And then we have always on outlets. So this is, I've used these ones in the past at my workstation. Every time I unplug my computer to go to a meeting, all my other peripheral devices turn off at that same time. So you can see a lot of great savings with this one as well. Um, and next slide. Just to reiterate, we do have that one page how-to guide, and this is really more focused for the master controlled power strip. Um, and again, it's, it's a nice printout that you can distribute to all of your building occupants. Next slide. The master list power strip. So this is really focused on what we call vampire loads. Um, so these, basically when, when computer, or when any electronic device is shut off often, or a lot of them still draw power. So the masterless advanced power strip turns off controlled outlets, including parasitic loads or vampire loads, when all controlled electronic electrical devices are turned off for this. So this is really diving into those vampire or parasitic loads in a building. Next slide. The next one I'll talk about is the remote switch power strip. Uh, and this basically just turns the entire power strip off with, with a remote switch. So this is, uh, you can have either a foot pedal or uh, a wall switch so that you can conveniently locate it so when you leave your office, just like you're turning off the lights in your office, you can also turn off your plug loads. So that's kind of another nice option. A lot of people like this based on the convenience factor of just having uh, an easy to reach switch to power on and power off their plug loads. Next slide. And this last one is an activity monitor. So this one detects activity in a room via uh, infrared uh, or an occupancy sensor or some other means, and it turns off the outlets if no activity is detected. 
Um, and this one's kind of interesting because we're seeing some advancements. And let's go to the next slide, actually. This slide is titled, A Tale of Two Tiers. So our Tier 1 advanced power strips are, are all of these power strips I just mentioned. Um, tier 2 goes a step beyond the Tier 1 by using advanced sensing capabilities to disconnect power to devices that are idle, uh, in addition to master switch control capabilities. So for an office setting, the advanced sensing capabilities monitor background computer processes to track inactivity or lack of engagement, and it offers some additional savings compared to that tier one. So it's really look at looking more at this occupancy sensing. Um, and the residential sense, uh, sector, oftentimes uh, the tier two advanced power strips are affiliated with um, home entertainment systems and they look at infrared signals from remotes uh, and, and see the time that between when you turn the volume up or turn the volume down or turn uh, the channel or maybe you're playing a game. Uh, so they're looking at those infrared signals as occupancy. So th these are kind of some newer advanced power ships coming onto the market. Next slide. So I'm, I'm building up here. So there's also, now we're seeing connected advanced power strips that are on the market. And so these ones uh, not only implement controls, but they have the capability to meter and track energy consumption. And often these companies offer a software as a service business model where they include the hardware, they have software, and they have typically cloud services where you can log in and actually look at that metered data and implement controls from an online dashboard. Um, sometimes these devices even connect to building automation systems, so that's uh, a nice add-on here as well. And uh, as, as far as the software as a service, business model goes, oftentimes there is some sort of monthly subscription that is applied to access the data through the online dashboard and implement controls as well. But it's a very, very convenient way to really get a good understanding of, of what your plug load data is consuming and understand what the best way is to control and set controls. Next slide. So we'll go even one more step further, and I will mention that since 2010, so now, uh, you know, we're in 2018, so since 2010, uh, ASHRAE 90.1, California Title 24, IECC, all these standard has, standards have required uh, that 50% of outlets in the specified spaces listed on this slide have automatic shutoff control in new construction buildings. Um, so this is really, you know, they, it depends on uh, what, what code has adopted for these standards um, and if they're actually being implemented in your area, but this has been in the standards since, since 2010 and that's really important. Um, one thing to note is that these automatic shot of control cannot be plug-in control devices, so it cannot be a, an advanced power strip. So uh, next slide. The market has really responded to this, and we're seeing a lot of these wireless meter and control devices, or what we call smart outlets, that are, are really emerging. Um, and oftentimes these plug into a, a traditional outlet, but they, they come with some sort of screw or, or way to secure the, the smart outlet to the normal outlet so that it can't be removed. And that actually does comply with these standards. Um, so these are, are, are really great and have a lot of applications. Um, what good, one good example is I've talked to a lot of school districts that are, have requirements to put air conditioning into every classroom. And when you have these old schools with pneumatic controls and uh, systems, these smart outlets can really help to collect data on window box air conditioners that they're installing um, and know 
when if they're being shut off at night by the, the teachers or not. And if they're not, they can uh, turn them off remotely through the online dashboard. So again, you know, these smart outlets come with connectivity. They're um, IoT devices. You should absolutely involve your IT staff when you are selecting these types of smart outlets and implementing them in your building. Um, but they really provide this convenience factor so that you can remotely look at data, understand what's happening, and implement controls from either an online dashboard or often they do integrate into building automation systems. Next slide. So this is my, my last slide here. I've kind of gone through the gamut of, of what we've, we've seen in the past or what we've traditionally been using and, and traditional advanced power strips and how they're evolving um, to these more uh, analytical smart outlets. And we're collecting more and more data as these systems are involved, but this really can help inform our decisions moving forward. Um, so we can really see what individual plugos are consuming. We can set better schedules to uh, really tailor to individual equipment. We can use this data to monitor device health for efficiency and failure. Uh, another example would be in a hotel in the hotel uh, looking at all the mini fridges or ice machines to make sure that they are cycling appropriately. You can see all of this with this, um, these, these little devices that can trend energy data and you can look at that data over time. We can also use the data to inform policies, perhaps that's energy budgets for, for people or equipment. This can also go into procurement policies. Um, and that ease of, of controlling equipment and managing data remotely is, is really powerful. Um, it just gives us that, that real-time data and we can make uh, more responsive actions to controlling our equipment in our buildings. Uh, and lastly, of course, uh, making sure that occupants are aware we can certainly automate the processes, but it's also important to educate occupants and engage with them on how they can better control their own equipment uh, and understand these new technologies that are coming onto the market and being um, implemented in, in their cubicles and their workspaces so that they understand how it's controlling their equipment and if they need to override it, they can. So I am going to wrap up with that, and um, I think we're taking questions kind of at the end. So next up is Dylan Cutler, also here at NREL, and I'll pass it over to him. Great. Thank you, Rose. Um, and so I, I'm going to be taking uh, it from that kind of really uh, great overview of the whole technology space into exactly what we did and tested. Um, in GSA Region 3. So yeah, my name is Dylan Cutler. I'm a senior engineer here at the lab and, uh, and was involved, I was involved in, in testing this technology. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is the, the, the report uh, that was put out. Uh, I think that's actually maybe the one page that's shown there, but there's kind of multiple documents from really high level overviews to a, a full uh, you know, uh, 20 or 40 page report on kind of everything that we looked at. Uh, this was uh, done in 2012, um, uh, but I think still has a lot of a lot of good data in it. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> so this is what we saw when we were um, doing the study. Uh, as you saw in Rose's slides, um, that 25% uh, of electricity end use in office buildings um, that has gone up to I think it was 30% in her slides uh, for for 2016, and is projected to continue to increase, um, you know, partly due to more connected devices and partly due to uh, kind of efficiencies in other uh, end uses, um, kind of moving a little bit faster. And so this, this opportunity is continuing to grow for, for us to save energy on, on the pl plug and process side. Uh, next slide. Um, and so this is uh, the, the, the power strip that we tested. Um, so this is made by Nmetric. Um, and so this was one of the types, uh, I think uh, one of Rose's slides actually had this in there. Um, 
So a few features about this, uh, and then I'll explain kind of how we used it. Um, this is one of the uh, advanced power strips that can sense data and send it to a bridge, which you see pictured on the right there, which then sends that data up to the cloud. Um, you can also program um, controls directly through a web interface that is then pushed back down to uh, the power strip. So those controls can be based on schedules, um, on a timer, so turn on at you know, 5 in the morning, turn off at 7 in the evening or something like that. Or they can be based on load sensing with the kind of master approach, uh, master uh, outlet, um, or both. And so I think, you know, uh, Kevin hinted at this a little earlier, but I, I think what um, was nice about this study is that we, I, I wouldn't say we tested a metric technology um, specifically, that we didn't focus in on exactly the only capabilities that they could do. Um, they have a lot of strong capabilities, and, um, and those were tested, but we leveraged the ability to program these, um, these strips uh, to do different types of plug load control to really try to evaluate um, and compare what timer-based versus load sensing versus a combination of the two um, delivered as far as savings. Next slide. Um, with the help of GSA's Region 3, we, um, we deployed in eight different buildings. So this was a pretty um, expansive test bed. Uh, the buildings are listed here. Um, and we split them up into four different groups, which I think is covered on the next slide. Can we go to, yeah. Um, Actually, I guess it's on the one after that, so I'll just explain right now um, that the, the eight buildings, we, we split them into four groups of two buildings each. One was a control group, one was the load sensing group, one was the timer-based controls group, and one was the combination group, um, and we'll get back to that. Um, so the test plan, uh, those three control strategies that we just kind of listed out, and we, um, we kind of uh, organized the data that we were getting back by space types. Um, workstations, printer rooms, and kitchens are common common areas. Um, I think, uh, you know, a lot of what we ended up seeing and, and why it's interesting to look at this by space type is that uh, these common areas such as printer rooms and kitchens, um, the occupants don't have the same level of kind of ownership over, over, over these, uh, whereas you know, you turn your lights out maybe when you walk out of your office or you shut your um, monitor down. Um, but people, uh, there isn't kind of one person that controls these, these shared spaces. Um, so they're, they're often a good opportunity for savings. Uh, next slide. This is kind of a diagram of the, of the general project flow. Um, on the top there, you see the four different uh, groups that I mentioned, so those, each of those um, kind of vertical arrows, down arrows there, has two buildings and, um, and lots of different devices in them being metered. And so the first one, you know, we didn't ever put in controls. All we did was pull data. They were essentially the control group, and we looked at kind of variation over the three months in that control group. Um, all the others have this baseline sub-metering section um, for uh, a a few weeks, um, and then we notified the occupants that um, these controls were going to get turned on, and then we, in some places, updated the controls based on trends. Um, you know, one kind of logical idea and what we wanted to do there in that last section is to tighten up um, or customize uh, schedule-based controls. So, you know, um, you know, if you see that kind of actually all the control, the, 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 the break rooms um, are used, you know, initial controls are from 6 to 6, and really it doesn't seem like any power is being drawn from that 6 to 8 o'clock window, um, you can kind of tighten up some of, some of the schedule controls. This didn't end up working all that well. I think we, you know, maybe it's just a lesson learned that there is opportunity there, but um, it can, if you're trying to tighten up too much, you can end up with, um, kind of frustration on the occupant side that things aren't on when they walk into the, to the office. Um, next slide. So this is just kind of one of the ways we looked at results. Um, 
what you're seeing here is the average daily profile for um, all of the printers uh, in the schedule-based controls. Um, the first graph is during the weekday, and the second graph is for the weekend. Um, and so this is a lot of different printers averaged across um, two buildings. Um, but over, over, the, over all of those printers, what you see is a high baseline, um, you know, never really going below 60 watts, and then staying on at 60 watts all weekend. And you multiply that by, you know, 10, 20, 100 printers, um, and that ends up being a lot of energy uh, that's being used. Um, what you see in blue is after we implemented the controls, you know, they're pretty much off on the weekends, off in the evenings and mornings, um, but, you know, they're still being used in the middle of the day. Uh, you know, why it stepped down there is there's probably some printers that were kind of just staying on all the time and didn't, weren't getting heavily used, but just kind of drawing that 60 watts or some, somewhere around there all the time. Um, and so those kind of stayed off. Um, and so you kind of get savings in a number of different ways. Uh, next slide. This is the same graphic for laptops. Um, not as dramatic of savings, um, but still some, some reduction on the shoulders of the, of the weekdays and, uh, and the weekends. Um, but, but less of you know, that kind of uh, during the day reduction. Um, people still needed to do their work. Uh, next slide. This is uh, kind of a look at the three different control types and, um, and the different uh, periods, so baseline initial controls and then refinement of controls. Um, we saw the, the biggest savings in the schedule-based controls um, relative to the load sensing and the combination. Um, there were still savings in the load sensing uh, approach, and I think it was somewhat complicated by the fact that uh, Ideally, you want to control off of um, something like the, the desktop or laptop computer. Um, in this case, um, we were having trouble with it kind of booting back up quick enough. Um, and so I think those got switched to an always on uh, outlet and we were controlling off the monitor instead and we weren't able to kind of get as, as many savings. So there's probably room for refinement on that. The schedule base, though, had really strong savings. Um, you know, they did have a higher baseline, um, and so maybe there was a little bit more, more opportunity there as well, but, um, but we, we, uh, we realized a lot of savings through that approach, and interestingly enough, that's kind of the most simple of these control strategies, and, um, and so, you know, in some ways, that opened up a lot of opportunities for the further deployment, as we'll see. Um, next slide. Um, oh, and I, I should have noted on that last one that, you know, 26% savings at, at workstations and 48% savings in kitchens and printer rooms. So really um, pretty, pretty uh, strong results there. Sorry, next slide. Um, so this was kind of what we um, took away from this initial uh, pass, you know, from our, from our um, analysis here was that these simple and actually uh, what you can do is with these schedule-based timers, um, or schedule-based APSs, advanced power strips, you don't need everything that Nmetric had, um, you know, necessarily to achieve that savings. Um, I will say the ability to get that data back and do the analysis of that, there's a lot of interesting opportunities there, uh, you know, that feed back into the, edu you know, a feedback loop into education of occupants, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and there's a lot of power in the program, programmatic um, rules approach. But what we saw is, you know, we can get these savings from this that we've established from something that costs, you know, a lot less than that full system with its cloud and, uh, you know, and, and software side. Um, you know, you can go get uh, a timer-based pl plug strip um, at Home Depot uh, or Lowe's for, you know, a fraction of the cost. And so that's kind of what we identified here is that there was a huge opportunity. This um, seemed like a good approach. Uh, majority of users didn't really want more control over their individual power strips when we um, surveyed them at the end of the uh, project. Um, and, you know, load sensing could, you know, as, as it improves, 
um, could be worth revisiting, but um, we moved forward with, uh, or GSA moved forward with the simple and lower cost schedule based. Next slide. Um, this is what we saw as far as kind of the economics, um, three-year payback um, for workstations, and this is at $22 per, per strip and half under a year, half a year for the common areas. So really strong uh, savings and payback and, and, and a very uh, tractable deployment strategy. Next slide. So yeah, we essentially recommended broad deployment, but there was a lot of opportunities and we were seeing pretty good, um, pretty good results. Uh, you know, some, some diff, you know, I think the occupant engagement side of this, and John uh, will speak to this a little bit more, it's really important. Some folks, you know, in this case, you had to reach under the desk to turn back on strips if they were in an off state. Uh, that wasn't great. So there's kind of some uh, occupant engagement, occupant uh, considerations, but, but in general, uh, recommending broad deployment. Next slide. And with that, I'll pass it on to John Teagan. He was um, kind of our our point of contact and and supporter in the in the region three and uh, coordinated uh, all of the testing in these GSA spaces. Thanks, thanks, Dylan. Um, yeah, I, I I was kind of the central point of coordination, but I do want to acknowledge uh, a lot of the people in the field: uh, Scott Wooten, John Remus, uh, Natalie Dre, Zach Spears, and and uh, I'm sure I'm missing some others. Um, that we're actually uh, living through these tests and uh, and really putting them on and, and coordinating for for me and and for GPG. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the timer that we, we tested was pretty powerful. The metric uh, timer um, it was generating so much data. I know the NREL guys were kind of complaining. Uh, you could take uh, a reading on what the, all of the four plugs of the, and the plug load was doing every second and upload that into the cloud, it was creating quite, you know, pretty big spreadsheets. So uh, you could program each plug uh, separately. Uh, it was Wi-Fi accessible, and uh, the IT issues were pretty big. When we first went to, uh, you know, even though IT security has always been important, it's not as high as it was now. And back when we tested this, the IT people didn't want anything to do with it as far as putting it on our system. And, and we had to come up with a workaround as far as um, hooking it up to uh, cellular uh, data to, to collect the data. Um, another problem we had when we first started doing that was that we had just, GSA had just, in Region 3, just removed desktop computers and everybody had gone to a laptop. Uh, the savings were projected to be significantly higher with the desktop computer, um, but uh, we all had brand new laptops and we're uh, happily not going to give them back. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the user experiences, um, we, we heard quite a bit. Uh, a lot of our GSA brothers and sisters did not like the aspect of um, having somebody know exactly when they turned something on or turned something off. Everything was being recorded. Um, that was probably one of the biggest problems. The other problem was the last one when uh, if you weren't sure if it was working or not, you had to get down on your hands and knees and uh, push the button as we had placed all of these beneath the desk. Um, a lot of them were getting kicked around pretty good, but uh, th that was a problem. Uh, the last thing was uh, when we started pressing the envelope and printers were being turned off when people needed them, that caused a great deal of uh, hate and discontent. Our initial placement, when we were basically doing it with a, uh, you know, a timed basis and everything was, was loaded well, um, users were very happy with it for the most part. But when, uh, and we had kind of let NREL kind of push the envelope to see what they could do with the load and the combination base. Uh, when they started doing that, uh, people started to complain. Next slide, please. Uh, picture there is uh, one of the units that was purchased and installed. Uh, most of these units are, uh, in Region 3 anyway, are still installed and out in the field. Uh, this one is in a uh, ops manager's office, Tom Rufo. Down the street in the Knicks building, uh, I went over and took a picture. Uh, he took a picture and sent it to me the other day when I forgot to take the picture. But uh, yeah, they're still installed, they're still being used, and, and that is the picture of one. Uh, when we first got it, you know, got into distributing these, uh, there was a lot of thought that, you know, what are we going to do with uh, 
all these 2,700 units that we had. But it turned out at the end that uh, a lot of agencies that we distributed them to called and went, uh, I'd like some more. So uh, getting people to adopt and use these, especially when we were when we were distributing them at the time, was not a difficult uh, thing to do. Um, and you know, we didn't really get any uh, negative blowback once we distributed and put them in. Uh, everybody seemed to be pretty happy with them. And the next slide. So that's all I have. I'm going to introduce uh, Nazarene. She was uh, key in making the purchase of all of these units. Thank you, John. Um, so my name is Nazarene Ege. I uh, work with the Office of Facilities Management. Back in 2014, I helped with the deployment campaign of these uh, advanced power strips. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so this slide, um, you will see that we break down per region how many devices were uh, deployed, and we had um, deployed over 16,000, just a little bit over 16,000 of them to um, 80 facilities, over 80 facilities across GSA um, into nine regions and central office. Um, they were installed in workstations and common areas within GSA and tenant spaces. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, so this slide just breaks down the details. The devices were purchased um, from Three Wire Systems LLC, and the choice to go with them uh, rather than the GSA schedule was the 35% discount, um, and the bulk purchase was TAA compliant, and um, the deployment of it. Once so, in the preparation of the deployment in January of 2014, we'd asked our regional POCs to develop a distribution action plan and determine their regional installation approach. Um, their action plans included the number of requested devices, um, estimated installation completion date, whether the devices would be going into GSA or tenant space, and if they would be in a workspace or a common area. So upon collecting their plans, we determined that 90% of the devices would be installed in uh, work, workspace, workstations, and 10% would be installed in common areas. Um, and the uh, estimated savings of the de these devices were predicted to be about $200,000 savings annually um, with 1.7 year overall payback. And the breakdown of that uh, workstations is 2.6 years common areas is uh, 0.4 years. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is what the device looks like, the advanced power strip. Um, you'll see the one touch button. Um, so you turn that on and your, the device stays on for 11 hours um, and it will shut off after that. There are two outlets, uh, two plugs in the front in the top portion that always stay on. Um, that's for the computers, phones, clocks. Um, so yeah, that's just an overview of the deployment. And if you have any questions or you want more details of that, just please reach out to me, let me know. Um, and that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you, Nazreen. Now we will go to the Q&A session. Let me call that up. <clears throat> so first question from Richard, is anyone looking at reducing the energy drain of plug-in refrigeration and freezer units? Um, I'm not aware of that, but do any of the presenters have any knowledge about that, what GSA and OFM? are doing in that arena? Yeah, the, this is Rose Langner from NREL. I know there's been research on uh, equipment types to purchase, so uh, especially for the, the deep freezers, for laboratories, et cetera, there's been some research on there. Uh, we might even have some up on the Better Buildings Alliance that you can reference. Um, 
But I do think that with the onset of these new connected devices that can meter and trend data, then you get a lot more information on exactly what those devices are doing. You can monitor their device health, and you can really see you know, which ones are operating appropriately and which ones uh, end up having faults in them. So that does take uh, an energy champion or someone who can log in and actually look at that data and make sense of it. Um, there, you know, I think that's maybe the, the next frontier of where these controls are going is, is doing some automated fault detection through bore plug loads um, with this data, but the, the companies um, haven't quite gotten there yet with, with enabling that function to individual buildings and pieces of equipment. So there, there's certainly options out there. And, and I do think these connected devices just offer a lot of opportunity to see exactly what's happening with, with individual pieces of equipment. Great. Thanks, Rose. Uh, James Silk asked, does GSA have a way to provide a rent reduction for saving energy? And um, <laughs> there's a long answer to that. Uh, thank you, David Johnson, for providing some insight to that. Um, I'm going to paraphrase, David, what you shared. But um, in most buildings, especially office buildings, uh, GSA's rent is based upon market-based appraisals. And those appraisals are typically on uh, market buildings that have what is called a gross rent, where everything's kind of rolled into one price. Um, we do have special use buildings like courthouses and labs that sometimes will have more of a direct rent where different components are broken out like utilities. But um, historically, GSA has not been um, able to provide an incentive for energy reduction. That being said, I have another GPG project for smart meters where I'm working with GSA's Office of Portfolio Management, whom controls GSA's what is called pricing policy. And they're looking at doing some pilots to actually provide incentives to agencies to um, encourage them to reduce their energy consumption in those spaces or um, uses, if you will, that they control. And, and therefore, um, stay tuned. Um, I think GSA kind of realizes the, the fallacy, if you will, in our pricing policy and, and the limitations it has. And so we're looking to the future to what we can do to provide those incentives to our tenants. Hey, Mike, this is Rose from NREL. Um, we also worked with uh, Jason Silken at GSA to develop a, uh, a case study on the Wayne Aspinall Federal Courthouse Building in Grand Junction, Colorado. And that is a, they, they did a net zero historical renovation of that building, which was really impressive. And to really get to net zero, they had to focus in on plug load energy efficiency. Uh, and I know that they do provide a percentage of the rentable square footage fee back to their tenants if they meet their plug load energy requirements or come in under under that. Um, and, and to meet those, the, I guess, targets, um, to meet those energy targets for plug loads, I know GSA spent time with each tenant to understand their mission and what types of equipment they really need to use to meet their mission. Uh, and came up with those targets based off of that. So it was uh, not just like a blanketed target for every organization, but they, they worked to figure out what would really be appropriate for that organization. Great, thanks. And, and the other thing I may add to what Rose just shared is that um, one of the difficulties in providing incentives to tenants is just the way the building is metered. Um, you know, typically, I mean, GSA has a big initiative right now to meter our buildings beyond just the building level utility meter. It's called advanced metering, but um, it's rare indeed, unlike the Grand Junction building where we have metering um, at the tenant level. And so that's uh, one of the other challenges um, enough said on that issue. Um, let's see, next question is Steve Dunn. Do advanced power strips meet the ASHRAE 90 point run requirements for 50% of outlets to have plug load control? And um, Jeff, Jeff Romph, I appreciate your answer. Jeff says ASHRAE 90.1 section 8.4.2 states plug-in devices shall not, by, shall not be used to comply with section 8.4.2, which is automatic receptacle control. So APS or automated plug strips do not apply to that requirement. 
and this is Rose Langner from NRL again. Um, I, I did go over that in my slides too. So the yeah, the advanced power strips don't comply, but we are seeing these uh, smart outlets that are coming out, and, and those are the products that that do comply that can be hardwired or actually screwed into the wall so they can't be removed. Thank you. Um, Tina asks, has information about the savings been shared with the end users in the buildings that incorporated the APS? Uh, does anyone know that answer? This would be more of a facilities question. John, did you, have you done that at all in Region 3? Um, sorry, I was muted. We we haven't really gone that far with it, so I can't really say. Okay, thanks. And Mike, I can say that they did look at that in Region Nine, but they weren't able to um, they weren't able to actually uh, calculate what those savings were. It was, um, but they did attempt to, but it wasn't. It was inconclusive. The results were inconclusive. Gotcha. James Carter asked, so that's the extent of that answer. I apologize. Um, James Carter, does GSA IT security approve this kind of device for government facilities? Um, John, in Region 3, did you have to go through any kind of approval process? Um, not to do the tests, no. We, uh, we basically set it up and we were able to go ahead and do it. Kevin, I don't know if you're aware of any IT uh, security processes we went through to do the actual deployment. Of course, we went, we, our deployment was a, a non-internet based, so, you know, didn't have IT security, I guess, implications when you look at what we actually deployed. Uh, I'm sorry, Mike, I was on mute and then I got thrown out. Um, we basically, yeah, IT didn't really want to have anything to do with that, that kind of data load go up into the cloud for our tests. And because of the unit you know, we were testing, it was very intensive data-wise. So we didn't even try to, to run it by IT. I, I don't know, based on experience that we're having right now with the DSN, uh, if this would be something that would be behind the secure uh, network, if they would let that go. But I have my doubts. Yeah, thanks. Greg asks, if all devices are shut down at night, Will startup loads increase in the AM over and above what they normally would have? Yeah, I can address that one. This is Rose again. Um, you know, I think if it's uh, traditional office loads, you're, you're, I mean, clearly it's going to go off and then just turn back on, but there's no ramp up time. I think if, if there is ramp up time, you might see uh, more of an increase. Um, and maybe an example of that would be these, you know, window box air conditioners that they're using. Uh, but typically, that's something that you should you should think about if it needs to be turned on an extra hour before people occupants are in the building. That's something that should happen, and you can implement uh, automatic. Uh, controls or remote controls using online dashboards if the, the device has that or not um, and that should be you know part of the equation when you're considering these these new devices uh, to both meter and control equipment in your building great thanks and then James Nelson asks are all of these uh, plague strips on GSA Advantage and if not, can you send out the manufacturer's links? And then David Johnson answers, uh, there are many of these strips on GSA Advantage, and David says he's purchased many of them several times. Jack Seeger asks, do these devices, when used on network computers, allow network wake up for nighttime backups and updates? Um, does anyone have any feedback on that from the presenter team? Yeah, um, yeah. I think there's a couple options for that. Um, the kind of there's like a wake on LAN uh, capability in some cases um, where these will will wake back up um, to to accept pushes, and these can also be scheduled. Often IT groups are already doing that, where they'll do all the pushes on Thursday nights, for example, or something like that. In which case, you could 
um, you can schedule all of the strips to be kind of back on um, during those periods potentially. And another option for this that we do here at NREL is we do have scheduled pushes for these updates that happen and then it's actually up to the user to update their computer themselves. So they're given about a week of time to update their computer at their convenience and if they don't update at that point then there is an automatic update that happens um, which I know I'm always guilty of I'll do that later I'll do that later and then I just shut down my computer and updates and you that's just how it goes so um, I think there's a couple options for IT staff to look into this uh, and it's, it doesn't have to be um, you know every night we need all of our computers on all the time because we need to have this flexibility and when we push updates it can be scheduled um, either with that wake on LAN technology or uh, giving the actual user the choice to to schedule those updates when, when they can at their convenience within a week of time or so. Great, thanks. And Todd Reeder asked, the inappropriate use of relocatable power taps, i.e. power strips, is a rather significant fire prevention and safety concern in our facilities. I know every fire protection engineering survey since I completed within Region 5, I'm finding daisy-chained overloaded power strips along with appliances and other heavy loads plugged in which are required to be direct connected to a permanent properly sized circuit. Has this concern been addressed in any way as a part of this GPG APS initiative? Um, John and Nazreen, do you know if we address that issue during our deployment? Um, I'm not aware of that being the case. No, we, we did not. Um, you know, most of what was plugged in was a desk lamp, a computer power strip or something. The load on that was very low, except for the, um, the printers, which had a little bit of a higher load. But we never got close to, um, you know, I mean, we could see and we're, and we're trending the load on each plug, and it, we never got close to what a uh, rated load was. Right. Okay, thanks. And, and, and from my perspective, you know, this is kind of a facilities management issue. It's, the, it's not the technology that's at fault. It's the implementation that's at fault. So uh, uh, definitely something that we brought up to the OFM office in Washington, you know, and I'm sure you've done that. Um, definitely an educational issue that needs to be shared across GSA. Yeah, and, and adding to that, um, you know, I, I know that at NREL we do have policies set in place and standard safety checks. So uh, we actually have electrical safety officers that walk around the entire building and check every single desk quarterly or biannually um, to make sure that we're not daisy chaining or plugging in loads that are, are too much for the actual power strip. So that can be more of a top-down policy-driven type of thing like you just said, Mike. Right, thanks. And then Dawei asks, on average, what do you pay dollars per kilowatt hour in GSA? And uh, frankly, GSA, because we're such a a large building owner, we can negotiate pretty favorable rates. So our GSA average cost of electricity is about 11 cents per kilowatt hour. Mike, I'm not sure. We're not hearing you. I'm not sure if you're... Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, Howard asked a question about um, operating cost within the uh, the rent, and as I explained, we have different rent structures. Sometimes it's a gross rent with most office buildings, and then we have some special use facilities where we do a, a more direct uh, pricing where it's, it has components to it, like utilities. Um, let's see. James Silk asks, can GSA fund and purchase these devices for other agencies? Um, Nazreen or John, I don't know if you had any um, instances of this within our deployment initiative. I would defer to Nazreen on that one. Azreen, did we address this at all during the deployment? We may not be hearing 
you, Nazreen, you might be on mute. Well, let's uh, maybe come back to that question. Okay. Next, James asks, um, kind of in the GPG program, the $100 question, how secure are these online devices? It seems like IP will have a major problem with them as they would be prime targets for hacking. Um, and James, as we alluded to earlier, we tested devices that were very robust and had, if you will, these kind of online cloud-based um, um, capabilities. Uh, that being said, what we actually deployed was what I would call kind of a, a dumber, if you will, APS that just was schedule-based. Um, so in this instance, it did not become an issue for us. I will tell you that with the, G the GPG program, for every technology that we taste, we go through an IT security assessment process. So um, it's an issue that the program in general and GSA as an agency is very familiar with. And so we do go for every technology through an assessment process to minimize, like you said, the potential for hacking. Uh, let's see, Gary, somewhat perhaps to uh, the issue about uh, cost of these technologies. BA-63 money could be used as an incentive to pay for upgrades to premium efficiency upgrades to HPUC and other equipment models, so APS might fall under that, under that, uh, under the APS. Uh, Patrick Poiko asks, since the time the APS have been deployed has the utility billing data been analyzed to see what actual savings have been realized, possibly just looking at a few of the AD facilities? Um, I'm not aware of any follow-up to that. Um, anyone on the no. presentation team? No, Mike, that was, that, that was in Region 9, we, that was, they did, we did look at it, but um, didn't come up with any conclusive results. A lot of the buildings that we deployed in were so big with such high energy usage, it was hard to tell. I mean, usage was trending down in those buildings, but to, to say how much of it was plug load equipment, how much of it was other steps that were being taken was very difficult to parse out. Nothing that we could put our finger on. Great, thanks. Uh, Thad Carlson asked, the uh, 2012 study is dated. Are there any plans for a new plug load study? And um, I will say at this time, the answer is no. Um, I don't know, Kevin, if you want to speak to that, but I know currently it's not in our plan. Kevin had to jump off the call, so um, I think we would have concur that okay. we don't have current plans, but there, there's a lot right. of future years. So um, I will mention, this is Rose, again, um, through, uh, Kevin had mentioned that the GPG program is partnering with DOE's High Impact Technology Catalyst program. Um, so through the selection of technologies, uh, NREL is actually doing a technology demonstration program with um, one of the, the wireless uh, meters and, and controls the, the smart outlet companies. Um, so we are currently conducting that uh, technology demonstration right now and uh, are wrapping it up uh, hopefully by the summer to have results that we can share with the public on, on that product. Yep. Great, thank you. And uh, wrapping it up, um, both Todd Reeder and Scott Martin, again, speak to the issue of inappropriate use of these automated plug strips. Um, I think it's fair to say that that misuse, if you will, does exist in our buildings, and that's an issue that uh, moving forward that GSA probably should take a look at. Um, with that, Andrea, I don't see any other questions. Can, can I just address one more that I think uh, was asked and we never answered it to, um, but uh, UL sure. safety listings I think came up and uh, I did want to mention that I know there's been some dialogue going back and forth of, of what UL listings are appropriate for advanced power strips. 
We do list those UL listings and what you should look for in the technical specification for advanced power strips that's on the Better Buildings Alliance Plug and Process Load website. So if you go to there, there they should be kind of outlined in, in that document for safety features. Great, thank you. Thanks, Rose, and thanks to all the presenters. And I should say that, that um, those specifications are also linked to from the GPG webpage on the uh, Advanced Power Strips for Plug Load Control report page um, in the list of additional resources, so you can get to it directly from there as well. Um, so thanks for all the great questions and to the presenters um, for today's webinar. So shortly, as mentioned at the top of the hour, uh, shortly after um, the conclusion of this webinar, everyone should be receiving a survey, um, a short five-question survey. And in completing that survey is where you can request continuing education credits. If for some reason you don't receive the survey, please reach out to Michael Hobson. And um, thanks again. And um, we look forward to uh, your participation in the next webinar in March. Thank, Thank you. you, everyone. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.